Welcome to Weather Extra. I'm meteorologist Jillian Johnson. We slowly made our way through the first full week of August and man oh man was it another brutally hot week. High temperatures at the Waco Regional Airport so far this month have ranged from 104 to 106. This repeated dangerous heat day after day has now led Central Texas to have the hottest start to the month of August ever on record. And with the nonstop heat we've been dealing with, we're climbing through top 10 lists we want no part of. As of Sunday, Central Texas has seen 41 100 degree days so far this year. Thankfully, we haven't reached into the top 10 list for most 100 degree days just yet, but the number to, uh, 10 spot on their list is 50 days, so we're approaching that number and will likely enter the top 10 list before summer is over. Now, one top 10 list we're climbing up on is the longest 100 degree streak. Now, we've seen 28 days in a row of triple digit temperatures. Our streak started back on Monday, July 17th. Those 28 days in a row now puts us in the sixth spot. But as you can see, the fourth and fifth spot not too far away from where we are right now, and we're expecting to continue to climb up this list as we make our way into the new work week. Now, another list that we are breaking into, and this is one that we really don't want to be in. So far this year, we have seen the second most 105 degree or hotter temperatures in any given year. Thankfully, we still have some ways to go before reaching that number one spot, which is 32 days set back in 2011. We now bring in meteorologist to CD Finley for an up to date look at the drought monitor and how our lake levels are sitting. Well, it is right. It has definitely been hot, but not only has it been hot, it's also been dry. We've seen some pretty good changes on the drought monitor. Most of our western counties are under an extreme drought now, and most of our eastern counties are kind of bridging on that moderate to severe drought category as well. So it's definitely been dry, and the dryness and the heat has been affecting our area lakes too. We've definitely seen how those have changed over the last month or so. Lake Waco has dropped about a foot and a half as far as the lake level is concerned. It's about 63% full. Lake Whitney is a little bit more full, 75.9% full, but about the same drop, 1.52 feet in the last month. And then Lake Belton has dropped even more than that, nearly two feet, 1.86 feet in the last month. And then Lake Stillhouse Hollow, also nearly two feet in the last month. Both lakes are about 61% full. So the heat has definitely been affecting us here in Central Texas in more ways than one. Well, thanks, CD. Some Central Texas homeowners are starting to see cracks in their yards and houses, and it's all because of the heat. News 10's Jasmine Lotz has more on why this is happening. Jasmine. You may drive past some homes and see cracks in their foundation or yards. The soil is changing on us. John Scales of Scales Engineering works on foundations and repairs cracks often. I've seen them really, really bad where you can stick your finger into the foundation, the crack of the foundation. Just nothing is going on except for the heat and the dry weather. News 10's meteorologist Sean Bellafuri says the soil shifting is a result of dry heat and drought conditions. Whenever we get all of the heat in combination with the dry weather, I mean, this is the second driest start to summer we have ever seen in history. That means that the, the soil itself also becomes stressed. It starts to crack more easily. It doesn't take the weight of all of the uh, all the concrete on top. Scale says many issues can come from cracked foundations like the doors, windows, and drainage systems not functioning properly. It's, it's more the functional problems that, and the aesthetic problems. You know, people don't like to look at cracks in the wall. They don't like to have doors that don't operate right. And, and uh, you know, this, there's the real problems. Scale says if you want to avoid this issue, use a soaker hose around your house a couple of times a week and let it soak the ground and, and try to maintain that moisture level so that things are not moving up and down and they're not changing. As long as we're keeping things the same, we're not going to experience a lot of problems. With the perfect combo of scorching heat and lack of rainfall, extreme fire danger has been put into place here in Central Texas and across a big portion of the state too. Wildfire activity has more than doubled across the Lone Star State in the week. Now, at the beginning of the month, there were just over 20 fires in the state. And at the end of last week, there's more than 70 fires reported. On this past Thursday alone, the Texas A&M Forest Service responded to 27 new fires. 
very dry vegetation combining with the extreme heat and strong winds, which leads to the perfect conditions that if any spark caught something on fire, that fire would rapidly spread, which is exactly what happened last week. A brush fire in Cedar Park outside of Austin destroyed at least one apartment building and damaged several others. Here's a look at drone footage showing you some of the damage caused by the fire. And here's another fire in Johnson County, south of Fort Worth. This fire scorched 1,400 acres and threatened nearby structures at one point. With many Americans dealing with this extreme heat and worsening drought, we've seen other fires erupt across the nation too. Here's a view of a fire in New Mexico. This blaze started from a lightning strike near the Santa Fe area. This fire was estimated to have burned 2,000 acres across a national forest. Hot, dry, and windy conditions made putting out this fire very difficult. And more fires broke out in the Mojave National Preserve in California and eventually spread over into Nevada. The fire had burned up to 70,000 acres. And it's not just us here in America dealing with the destructive and deadly wildfires. Over a thousand firefighters were deployed to stop three different fires across Portugal last week. Many citizens across the country faced evacuation orders as flames engulfed everything in its path. And in Italy, wildfires raged near Sicily. Fires led to the shutdown of local airports and caused 1,500 people to evacuate. Take a look at this dramatic eyewitness video that captured the flames nearing a highway. The worst fire of the past week was the one that tore through parts of Hawaii. Fast spreading flames fueled by dry conditions and hurricane force winds left thousands of residents fleeing for their lives, with some being forced to jump into the ocean to escape the blaze. Flames engulfed entire towns on the island of Maui. Hundreds of homes and businesses are destroyed as winds from Hurricane Dora turn small brush fires into raging infernos. CBS's Mark Strassman takes us to Hawaii. <laughs> Damn it. Iconic Lahaina, a paradise lost. Let's go! Damn, it's hot. Winds from a hurricane south of Maui with gusts up to 70 miles per hour pushed flames that raced across the island and fueled several large wildfires. In a horrifying instant, a wall of fire charred a piece of Maui all the way to the ocean. The Coast Guard rescued at least a dozen people from these waters, their only refuge with flames menacing all around. Oh. Somebody's down right yeah, here. somebody's down. We can't do nothing for her. Thousands of people were evacuated, including Dan Sonneson. He shot these images today on Maui, a horizon of smoke and flame. His vacationing family of three from Colorado now stuck sleeping in their car. It was awful for all the natives especially. and. You lose a place like Lahaina. It's so historic. Oh my God! Daybreak showed the scope of the calamity. Flames had wiped out hundreds of homes and businesses and Hawaiian history. Lahaina, a mecca for tourists, used to be the capital of Hawaii's ancient kingdom and a major fishing port. It's just such a cool old town. It's really tough to think about. Witnesses say Lahaina lies in scorched ruins. Everything's gone. This is a time we need help. We need to be stand together. We need to be brave for each other. We are just struck by the devastation felt on Maui. Mark Strassman, CBS News. Back here in central Texas, we haven't seen any measurable precipitation in a very long time. You saw earlier in the show how the combination of heat and lack of rain have had significant impacts on drought and also our area lake levels. As we're climbing our way through top 10 heat list, we're also making our way up one that has to do with the lack of rain. It has been 58 days so without measurable precipitation falling at the Waco Regional Airport. That streak now puts us in fourth place on our, on our top 10 list. We still have a few days to go until we get to that third place of spot there, which is 61 days set back in 2012. But we hopefully won't get to that number one spot, which is 62 days or excuse me, 82 days set back in 1924. And take a look at this. It's been 81 days since we've seen at least a half of an inch of rainfall and 95 days since we saw an inch or more. 
So since we've been on a very long stretch of rain-free conditions, we haven't been able to use this just yet, but the KWTX weather team is expanding our network of radars to help you stay safe when severe weather strikes. The next time we see rain, you'll be able to use this new tool. Coming up on Weather Extra, we learn more about this new radar and why it's so important for us here in Central Texas. Our goal is to protect Central Texas during severe weather. To accomplish that, we need sophisticated tools. Coming soon, KWTX and Centex Roof Systems are partnering to expand our radar network so we can track storms sooner and with more detail to alert you first and keep your family safe. Centex Roof Systems cares about you and your hometown weather and is proud to partner with the KWTX radar network. Centex Roof Systems is your hometown roofer. KWTX is expanding our network of radars to help bring the best coverage of storms to Central Texas. In this week's Degrees of Science, we're chatting with the Chief Meteorologist Brady Taylor to learn more about this new radar and how it's going to benefit us. So Brady, can you tell me a little bit more about this new radar? Yeah, so you know, all TV stations use what's called NEXRAD radars. So those are what the National Weather Service uses to help us know what's going on in storms. Great radars, but now we're adding another radar in Hamilton that will help us see storms better as they're developing and pushing through Central Texas. And why is it so important for Central Texas to get this new radar? So the, the importance is when you're watching storms on radar, you want the most accurate kind of low level view. You know, we're, we're great. We've got a great team of meteorologists looking at data. We've got great storm chasers going out, but now we can see lower in the storm. So the lower you see, the better the, uh, the rotation you can see inside the storm, see what's moving around in it. And the problem we run into now is we have a radar in uh, Granger, we have a radar in Fort Worth, but with the curve of the earth, the farther you get away from that radar, the higher you see in the storm and it limits some of the ability we have to really alert people first when it comes to strong storms. And so why is the radar located in Hamilton? So Hamilton's kind of a hole in our area, really our west and northwestern counties. If you think the city of Hamilton's about 80 to 90 miles away from the Fort Worth radar and just about the same from the Granger radar. So it, the radar's hitting way up high in the sky so we don't get a good low level view of the storm. So the reason that we put it or it's put in Hamilton is not only is there that hole, but if you think a large majority of our storms that move in, particularly spring storms, start in our western counties or off to the northwest. So this will allow us to see storms earlier get a better view of them and alert people better on what's going on and hopefully provide the information they need to get to be safe with these storms. And so this past spring, we had a few of those storms located right in that radar gap. Yeah. Uh, and so how are we going to be, you know, seeing some improvements from this? I know we both kind of yeah. experienced that. Yeah, this year. <laughs> so back, back in April, we had back to back weeks of really strong storms. We had the one that brought the baseball size hail to China Spring. The next week we had a storm that eventually produced a tornado across parts of Fort Hood. That storm formed around Pottsville, which is out in rural Hamilton County. From Hamilton westward, particularly anywhere in most of Hamilton County, uh, you need to be taking tornado precautions right now. We've got a significant storm that is showing pretty significant rotation. We're hitting the storm a little high up in the thunderstorm, so we're not gonna see right down to the ground, but you see these reds and these greens. That is signs that this is significant rotation inside of the storm and something that we've got to watch very closely with. Well, now with this radar, it will have a better view. It will see lower in the storm and allow us to know on these fast moving developing storms what's going on. We got good view of it because we had storm chasers out there that were able to see the low levels, but now we can see the rotation. We can see the potential for hail growth. We can see the heavy rain on storms that we didn't see very well. And you've got a perfect example of the hail back in June with a storm near Gulfway, right? Yeah, so I mean, it was probably right after midnight. We had this storm that just would not give up. It was moving through Brownwood and just continued to strengthen. It was the same thing. It was showing some broad level rotation, but really it was all about the hail and the radar was estimating, you know, penny size to golf ball hail. And then we were starting to get pictures from viewers at home showing baseball size hail. So it just shows you, yeah, where that radar is scanning in these storms. And I mean, it would be really helpful that yes. night, you know, because yes. it's, it's already dark and we don't really have ground truth of what's going on until people can send it in. So yeah, I'm really looking, I'm looking forward to this yes. radar. I think it's going to be a great tool mm -hmm. for us. Um, as far as, you know, the technology and our app, we have a lot of tools mm -hmm. that we use. So what is the radar going to be looking like for people that uh, will have access to it? Yeah, when you watch it on TV, you'll, you'll notice a clarity to it compared to what we see with the next radar radars. So it's interesting. It's not huge. It's, and it doesn't use a lot of power. It's a thousand watts 
lots of, uh, of power in it, but it's going to give us all the same products the National Weather Service does, but what's called an X-band radar. It's actually the most precise and uh, fine-tuned radar there is, so we will have better clarity to see you know, any hooks in the storm or any uh, exact details in it. And when it comes to our app, here soon it will be a, a layer inside of our app. So you can look at the, the composite radar of all the radars that the National Weather Service used. But here in Central Texas, you'll get to see our radar and see how it looks in your area. So, you know, it, it's just another tool in our tool belt. I mean, we've got the most experienced weather team in Central Texas. Again, we have more storm chasers we can send out than anybody. Now we have the best radar in Central Texas that expands our network, and allow us to see stuff that we may have never seen before and provide those warnings earlier, more accurate information as storms are moving in. Well, I hope I hope uh, one thing's for sure, and that's we get some rain. Yes. So we can actually use this <laughs> yeah. radar because, yeah, it's very oh, yeah, hot it's gonna, and dry. It's going to be a dusty radar. Hopefully, yeah, we, I ho hopefully it'll bring us some rain. That would and be nice. nice. Yeah. Some good luck, yeah. that's for sure. Welcome back to Weather Extra. Tornadoes, floods, and blizzards are just some of the weather disasters the U.S. has experienced through the first seven months of this year, and they've all been costly. A new government report says it's tracked 15 weather events where the cost and damages exceeded a billion dollars, which is a record. The National Centers for Environmental Information keeps track of this data and says the number of a billion dollar storms is the highest since 1980. Overall, the weather disasters have cost nearly $40 billion and are to blame for more than 110 deaths so far this year. And we still have four and a half months to go. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says the damage done by the wrath of Mother Nature cost at least $177 billion last year and more than a trillion between 2016 and 2022. And we had another devastating weather disaster take place in the U.S. as last work week started. A powerful storm system swept through the eastern United States, bringing heavy rain, thunder, and violent winds. The damage from the intense storms was scattered from Alabama all the way to upstate New York. Mike Valerio shows us some of the destruction. Trapped after torrential rain, a delegate and historic rescue north of Boston. First responders take hold of a driver, water flooding up to her window, and then float her back to safety. In North Carolina, oh trees simply snapped outside of Charlotte, careening feet from families hunkering down. The rain was literally sideways, trees, limbs hitting your truck as you're driving. In Anderson, South Carolina, firefighters said a falling tree killed a 15-year-old. The high school sophomore's closest friends and family devastated. They continue to cope and deal with the tragic loss we've experienced here. I just certainly feel for them. They're, they're wonderful neighbors. Uh, I just can't imagine going through what they're going through. Staggering scenes near Baltimore where giant utility poles proved no match for the winds. One after another knocked down, some around drivers. Maryland State Police say first responders rescued 47 people from this wreckage. Last night, lives were saved. There were people who were stuck and stranded in cars who were able to sleep in their own beds last night. In the heart of Philadelphia, a tower cam showed the skyline swallowed by storm clouds. The side of this huge Tennessee warehouse looking more like a Lego set. Layers of heavy cinder blocks buckled. Roofs ripped away, scattered across the ground. And in the air, an all-out effort to get thousands of people back on planes. After ground stops stretched from Atlanta up the eastern seaboard to New York. I'm Mike Valerio reporting. And other parts of the United States and even across the globe have been dealing with devastating flooding last week, too. Take a look. Take a look at this drone footage that captured the moment a house collapsed into the Mendenhall River in the Alaskan capital following glacial floods last weekend. Record flooding struck the city of Juneau on Saturday after a glacial dam outburst, which destroyed at least one structure and prompted city officials to issue evacuation orders for residents on one street. And in New Mexico, heavy rains fell over Albuquerque this past Tuesday. That rain caused many area roads to flood and was falling so hard at one point visibility was lowered, making driving extremely dangerous. And across the world, devastating flooding took place in Slovenia, which ended up killing at least six people and racked up property damage estimated to be over 500 million U.S. dollars. The prime minister calling it the worst natural disaster to ever hit the country. And a powerful storm battered Norway and Sweden early last week. Landslides occurred that were triggered by heavy rain in southern Norway. Dozens of roads were closed due to flooding, too. In both countries, dozens of people were 
were evacuated, and there are reports of helicopters being used to fly people out of affected areas. Welcome back to Weather Extra. NASA is out with an update on the next stage of its Artemis missions as it works to put humans back on the moon. A crew of three Americans and one Canadian will journey around the moon and back to Earth in November of 2024. The goal is for the 10 day space flight to test the Orion spacecraft's life support missions and confirm what's needed for humans to live and work in deep space. The four person crew got to see their spacecraft for the first time last week. Commander Reed Wiseman says their thoughts are on how future astronauts will use the equipment. For the four of us sitting here, the measure of success for Artemis 2 is seeing our colleagues on the lunar surface, seeing our colleagues assembling Gateway, and then seeing people that are following in our footsteps walking on Mars and coming back to planet Earth. If this next stage is a success, NASA hopes to land astronauts on the moon in 2025 and eventually take aim at Mars. And before we go, experts are raising the odds for an above average hurricane season as ocean temperatures continue to climb above record levels. The National Oceanic and Atmos Atmospheric Administration released its initial 2023 Atlantic hurricane season outlook back in May. At that time, they said there was a 30% chance of above normal activity. Now it's up to a 60% chance. The schedule update calls for 14 to 21 named storms up from the earlier prediction between 12 and 17. No predicts there will be 6 to 11 hurricanes with 2 to 5 forecast to become major hurricanes of category 3 or higher. The May outlook predicted between 5 and 9 hurricanes with anywhere from 1 to 4 becoming category 3 or higher. The new outlook includes the five named storms that have already formed this season, but the forecast does not project how many storms would impact or make landfall in the United States. That's all we have for you for this week's weather extra. Stay cool and hydrated everyone. We'll see you again next weekend.